All right, good afternoon. It is so good to see each and every one of you. I know you are full and so much has been poured in and we're grateful for it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jesse Harris, who put all of this together. Let's give him a hand of encouragement. He put a lot of work into this. Thank you, Dr. Haynes as well for the introduction. Dr. Orge as the president. Uh, we're grateful for you opening up the doors to all of our churches so that we can come and receive some spiritual food, especially in the area of apologetics. Uh, and then uh, we are grateful for all of the presenters in the breakouts. Thank you for uh, sharing from the abundance of your uh, experience. Amen. Uh, I can tell you my head is still spinning. I was just in the occult uh, class. And so, and then before that, the uh, science class, and then before that in the AI class. And yes, so you know what we are feeling. There's a lot of information. And I know right now you may be feeling somewhat overwhelmed, a little bit of the fire hose effect. And so I'm praying that uh, in these uh, final moments that we have in this time together, that this will in some way kind of synthesize everything you've taken in up to this point uh, in more of a practical application way. Amen? Uh, which is exactly what we want. Uh, I suppose, okay, they'll, they'll do it. So if you have your Bibles, if you could turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew, and we'll be in the 16th chapter. You have that. Hope everyone received Adam Groza's book. This is a great book here, Faith Wins. But if you didn't, make sure you get a copy of it. I know he was giving those away. Grateful for Dr. Orge and his words this morning and Dr. Groza this afternoon all have been a blessing. But if you have your Bibles, Matthew 16, we'll be starting at verse 18. And if we have it, can we give a hearty amen? And we'll be in this 16th chapter. And I say unto thee, that thou art Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want to talk about today the keys to success. But I know a lot of you, as we were saying, are already a little bit tired, a little bit perplexed, a little bit distressed, maybe ready to go on home. You probably even want to uh, do a little snooze right now. So let me give you something that's not on the PowerPoints and that is not on your handout. And I think this will bring all of it together, why we are really here, what it is all about. One phrase and then some numbers. But we are here because we want to do all we can to seek those that are lost and to disciple those that are already found. Right? We want to do the lost and found. We want to seek those that are lost and disciple those that are found. Now, a few numbers that I want you to jot down if you would like. This really brings it home. The first number is 155, 252. 155,252. The second number is 154,937. 154,937. Second, third number is 157,690. 157,690. The fourth number I want you to jot down is 173,451. It's not on your PowerPoint, it's not on your paper. Jot down those four numbers, and I know you're already wondering. Some of you know what that number represents. But that number represents something that our International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention, for about the last six or seven years, they've been putting out a number that reflects lostness. And so that number speaks of how many people per day 
die without knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Currently, that number is 173,451 people per day, which averages out to two people per second. Just let that land on you for a second, the gravity of the lostness that we're dealing with, of how many people don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So why are apologetics so important? Why is it important for us to share our faith? Why is it so important for us to be about lost and found that we seek those which are lost and disciple those that are found? Well, because two people per second are dying going to hell. We made 250 copies of these programs for you sitting out here today. 250 people. If Gateway had services every week, pack this out with 250 people for 52 weeks, some mathematicians, what would that be? Like 13,000, right? 13,000 people. 13,000 people coming through here still pales in comparison to 173,000. 451 people per day. We won't have that many people come through here in a year. That is why we are here. This is why you sat in the breakout sessions. This is why you heard from Dr. Orge and Dr. Grosa this morning. And this is why we're going to close out speaking about the keys to success. Uh, before we really get into the keys to success, it's important that we talk about the locks of failure. And when I say locks to failure, uh, we've got to conquer these things. Uh, and when we say conquer, it is intentional. Anybody that's here from St. Stephen and are part of our Lent commitments, they have on a little band right now, and that band has three words on it. That band has a word that says winner, that band has a word that says overcomer, and that band has a word on it that says Conquerors. We got a few St. Stephenites in the house. That's a good thing. But there's a progression. So you can win at something, but that doesn't mean you've overcome it. You can overcome something, but that doesn't mean you've conquered it. Right? You can overcome something and it's still there. And you can win at something, but it can still be. But when you have conquered it, you have killed it. You have defeated it. It is non-existent or it is no longer a threat to us. And so there are some things we're winning at. There's some things we've overcome. And then there's other things that we have conquered. But there's some things that I want to talk about briefly here in the conquering of some locks to our failure, because that's the opposite of keys to success, right? The very opposite of the lock is the key. The very opposite of success is failure. Well, what kind of successes and failures, what kind of things do we grapple with? And I just want to hit two of them. They're on your sheet. The first one is fear. Right. That is a lock. And when we talk about a lock, we're actually talking about things that cripple us, things that keep us from being apologists for the gospel, things that keep us from being the best husband, the best wife, the best father, the best professional, of course, the best Christian fears. Now, you can Google, go on your phones right now. You can Google what are the top fears that we contend with on a daily basis? And they come up all the time. Top 10 are around the same things. Always fear of heights, fear of falling, fear of failure. Uh, fear of spiders, all those things are fears, and we know them and we know them well. The fears that we don't speak of a lot is the fear of shame, the fear of being embarrassed. Or how about this one? The fear of being hurt. Right? There's a lot of things we don't do because we've been hurt, and since we know what hurts feels like, the last thing we want to do is be what? Hurt again. And so it becomes a lock to our success. It keeps us from moving forward and we become ones that are paralyzed to our past experiences. So fear is a big thing. The next one is what Dr. Groza was speaking of, which is our disbelief. When we talk about doubt, we talk about disbelief and I would just say and posit that, that doubt is something that is normal. Now, we all have doubts. But I would move to say that disbelief is actually a state of being or a final position. It actually speaks to a conclusion, right? So when you have disbelief, that means I have come to the conclusion, whether it's through facts or data or experientially, that this is the position that I have and the position is disbelief. And that's an issue. 
right? And if we have disbelief, it is very difficult to be an apologist for the gospel. I've got to believe in this word, got to know that it is true, got to believe in the Trinity, got to believe in Jesus Christ coming through a virgin and that virgin never being touched by her husband. That's things that I have to believe in. I've got to believe that Jesus Christ died and that he went into the tomb and that the third day the Father resurrected him with all power in heaven and on earth. I have to believe that without question. That's what's important. And some of us struggle with believing some things. We may believe that, but it's hard to believe that, Lord, right now, I don't have any money in my bank account and I don't know how I'm going to pay my mortgage. And it's hard to believe you. As we say at St. Stephen, it's hard to trust God when we can't trace what he's doing. That's where some doubt and some fear can come in, maybe because he may do it for others. But that doesn't mean that he will do it for me. And so fear and disbelief are things that we have to overcome in order to make sure that we can move forward with the keys to success. Otherwise, we'll be held back by the locks of failure. Now, as we move forward here and discuss this as well, I just want to kind of give an overview of where we're going and what we're doing. But I want you to remember some things that are important as well. Remember that that God is the one that has the church. And this is what we're going to see in the text. Who's the church is, right? Who the church is and what the church is promised, right? All things that are critically important. Who the church is and what the church is promised and who's really the church is. This text will show us those things. So let's dive into this real quick. Before we get to the text that we have, and I know I need to speed along, um, we want to start in the 16th chapter. We want to start at the first verse to get the context of really what's going on, and we'll speed through this. Verse 1 says, the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, tempting him, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven, that everything that you've been saying and doing is real, meaning help our unbelief. Help our doubts. He answered and said unto them, listen, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And I guess you guys already can tell I'm reading from King James Version. I know you guys are seeing me as a heretic right now, but, you know, this King James just resonates with me. And it's the most holy Bible there is. And so uh, I'm grateful for it. But verse three says, and in the morning, it will be foul weather today. For the sky is red and lower. And he says, oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto you, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And he left them and departed. And you remember what Jonah said, Jonah, you know, he didn't want to go to the people of Nineveh. So when God actually made him go, he went on and, and went in obedience to God, but uh, he didn't say repent. He didn't say God loves you. He didn't say the grace be with you. He didn't give a bunch of apologetics. He just said in 40 days, the whole city is going to be destroyed. All these, hopefully y'all don't know what I mean. But that wasn't the case. Of course, we know they changed. But verse 5 says, and when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. These are his disciples. They forgot to do what they were supposed to do. And then Jesus said unto him, take heed, and beware of the leaven, of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread that he's talking about this. I don't know what's going on here. Which, when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little what? Why reason you among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Why are you thinking along those lines? Why are you concerned about bread? When, when we needed bread, I addressed that issue. Obviously, I'm speaking about something more specific and more serious. Verse 9, do you not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? You took up 12. You took up more than you started with. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up, seven even after that. He says, how is it that you do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that you should be aware of the leaven 
of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that, that people around you are going to be very critical of what's said and inaccurate of who said it. Verse 12, then understood they how they might bathe them not to be aware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine, the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So then when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, this is where it gets good. It's starting to move, it's elevating, it's moving. And he says, who do men say that the son of man am? And they said, some say that you are John the Baptist, others say you're Elijah, others say you're Jeremiah, or one of the prophets perhaps, maybe. Then he said unto them, this is what we want to ask people, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter, of course, we know him. He jumps right off. He says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Huge, profound, right? That, that's what we all want to be able to say. This is the part that's so critically important in verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, this is a pivot verse, blessed, highly favored, fortunate, well off are you, Simon Barjona. Listen at this part, this is important. For flesh and blood, for flesh and blood have not revealed, uncovered this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. The text now makes a distinct move from the physical to the spiritual. So as you move here in this text, now you have to respect the movement that has happened in this text that Jesus has now put in place saying, now we're moving from the natural to the supernatural, that we're moving from the flesh to the spirit. He says, I want you to know Simon. I want you to know Tony. I want you to know Orge. I want you to know Groza. I want you to know Harris, all of you. I want you to understand that it is not your flesh. It is not your blood that has acknowledged the presence of the almighty. It is the spirit of God that has given you, provided you that insight. It is the father, which is in what? heaven that made this happen and he says and i and i say that i is important and i say and i say also unto thee as we move into the text that we're dealing with for these couple moments and as i say also unto thee that thou art peter that thou art petros because theologians they start taking off all over the place here and i know there's some great theologians here at gateway and i'm glad they take off all over the place and i understand why but in this text he says but you are peter goes back, says, you are this human, you are this person, you are Petros. He says, but upon this rock, rock here's Petra, play on words. So another thing is thrown in and introduced that now the writer here, Matthew is doing a play on words and we are now in the spiritual realm. The play on words is Petra and Petros. So the question comes out all the time, he says, well, is Jesus now talking about Peter? Is Jesus now talking about himself as the rock? Or is Jesus talking about Peter's confession that he made that then speaks to all of us as believers? That's where theologians wrestle. So let's we'll say that again. So the question here that comes up theologically in this text is, are we talking about Jesus? Are we talking about Peter? Or are we talking about Peter and his actual confession? which connects to us and us being a confessional body of believers. Well, I, I'm no theologian, but I'll just go with what the Bible says and I say yes. I'm, I'm one of those that just loves to take a test and just hit E all of the above. It's the simple way. And I believe in the, the text contextually does let us know that it is indeed uh, it, it appears to be all of the above, and we'll see how this unpacks and how this unfolds. He says, but listen, I, here's another I, I will build my church. And this I will build here, this word build or that construct of words actually speaks of what we think of as construction. But remember, this is spiritual. The text has turned. And so spiritually, what this is speaking of is the words, you know, discipleship. It's talking about the growth of the believers. At St. Stephen, right now, our theme this month is discipleship. 
We have a working definition of discipleship and we say uh, biblical discipleship is growing, towing and showing our faith in God. That's just a simplified version of what discipleship is. And so what he's saying, I will build, I will disciple, I will grow spiritually, but he says, I will do it. And then what does he say? My. Pay close attention to the three eyes in these verses. We've already seen two. Also notice the my, right? He says, this is my church. Who is the church as we ask? Whose church is it? And then what promise did he give the church? All of these things are being laid out by the text, right? Whose is the church? It's God, it's Jesus, it's, that's whose it is. Who is the church? And so you are church, right? It's not the church address, it's not the building, it's not the person next to you. Uh, when we all walk out of this building and, and leave this campus, we are all individual churches. We are all representatives and ambassadors of God. More specifically, we are all disciples and we are all Jesus Christ's possession. My church, that's good news, amen? Praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. That's, that's good stuff. You are my church. This is where it gets even better. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Did you hear what that said? So who's the church? I am the church. And whose church is it? So you're the church. God owns you, and then God drops down a promise that says what? The gates of hell shall not what? Against who? Me. Yeah, the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. That's, that's used, that's important theologically for us to get, because it's, we have winner on here, we have overcomer on here, we have conqueror on here, but has anybody ever lost? Has anybody ever failed? Has anybody ever come short? Yeah, there's a big difference between failing and being a failure. Big difference, right? So God can erase our sins and our faults. The blessing is God says you're not the sum of your rights and you are not the sum of your wrongs. Can we say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord? Good news. Y'all getting me happy. Y'all got to slow down here. Slow down. But he says in the text, the gates of hell. And when you see gates, you're like, man, gates, is that offensive? Is that defensive? What's going on here with the gates? Well, we know in Greek, gates here actually speaks of power. Right? And so what he's saying is the power of hell. Now, this part theologically, I think, is a little pushing, too, because we don't always deal with this. When we talk about hell, we, we kind of talk about that final destination, right? We think, man, as people are going to hell, and that's true. But there's more to it than just people are going to hell. And it's important that we know this. So if you can flip quickly over to Revelations 1. In the 18th verse of Revelation 1, I know, oh my God, we're in a spooky book. Revelations 1.18 says, I am he that liveth. Who are we talking about? Jesus, God, right? I am he that liveth and was dead, right? He did die for us. And behold, what? I am alive for how long? Forevermore. And then he says what? So be it. But then what does he say? And have keys, what? Of hell and of death. Keys. Huge, right? Flip on over to Revelation 20. Revelation 20, 13, 14, 15. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And what does your Bible say? And did what? So death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And what happened? Every man according to what? Dealt with our works. What does the next verse say? And death and hell, hell, Hades, were what? So instead of people say, saying, you go to hell, we should actually be saying what? Go to the lake of fire. That's where you're going. Do you know hell is just a temporary destination? 
It's just a holding cell of the badness, and then it gets worse. You get tossed into what? The lake of fire. This is not opinion. This is from the word of God. He says, he says this is the second what? Death. And so when he goes back here and he says, I want you to know, going back to Matthew 16 and in the end of um, verse 18, and he says, and the gates of hell, right? And the, 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 the power of hell and that influence and all that it does and holding us in this negative place, he says, it shall not prevail, it shall not win, it shall not overcome, it shall not conquer each one of us. Simply saying, if you are a believer, you need to know you're not going to hell or to the lake of fire. That's some good news. That's a reason to know the Lord and not end up in that burning pit. All right, that's hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. That's that's a reason for anybody to get converted, at least to have fire insurance. Then he moves to the part and I'll try to close out. I don't know how much time I got. They're going to be yanking me off of here. Verse 19. And he says, and I, that's the third eye. You see the eyes? Verse 18, and I say unto thee. And then he continues, and he says, and I will build my church. And then he says, and I will give unto thee. I will give unto thee. What is he giving? This is where it starts to get important. We move into the guarantees that he's going to give. We move into the accessibility, and we move into the ability that he is going to give to who? Theologians would debate, is it going to Peter? Theologians would debate, is it going to Jesus? Theologians would debate, is it going to Peter's declaration? And then it goes to the rest of the church. We pick E, all of the above. And I will give unto thee, which means you and me, the keys. Keys here in Greek is actually just speaking of control. I will give unto you the control of what? The kingdom. And you know kingdom. Kingdom is powerful in Greek because it actually speaks of those R's that you're so familiar with. It speaks of the royalty. It speaks of the realm. It speaks of the reign, right? It speaks of all of those things that are so powerful about God. And so kingdom in and of itself speaks of that, but it, it also speaks of power. And so I'm giving you control and I'm giving you power. And this is why the words exousia and dunamis, you've probably heard dunamis many times speaking about power, dynamite power, but exousia speaks about authority. And so if you have power, you need to have authority. And if you have authority, you need to have power. It's the same as a police officer. The authority is the badge and it's the law and it's the support that we give as a community to that law enforcement. But there are some unruly characters that are out there and even though they see the badge, they still may not adhere to the laws and so they have a weapon and that weapon becomes their power to carry out their authority. God gives us the authority, he gives us the exousia, and he gives us the dunamis and the power to carry out his mission and his plan, which is evangelism and discipleship. To seek out that which is lost and to disciple that which is found. 173,451 people per day dying on their way to hell. I have empowered you for that purpose. What did I give you? The kingdom of heaven. God's abode, God's house. Man, that's, that's special. You, you, you think you're doing something when you upgrade in your house. You think you're doing something when you get some new furniture. You think you're doing something when you go to, you know, you ever been to the open houses? You ever been to one and it's all nice and you're like, man, I wish not. But have you ever been to a house that you never thought you would be in? It? Never, you, I would never be here. Can you imagine God inviting you over to his house? God said, I've given you the keys to the literal big house. Now, he isn't just speaking about the residents. Just like the church is in our church houses, he's speaking about the people. What he's saying is, I'm allowing you to have intimacy and closeness with the divine, with the creator. You can hang out with me. That's powerful. Y'all, y'all, y'all not getting it, but it'll catch up with you later. It's, he says, you can hang out in the kingdom of heaven. Then he gives this other promise that he says, I will give you the keys 
And when I give you these keys, and whatsoever thou, listen to those thou's, whatsoever thou shall bind, tie up on earth, that is this planet and all the inhabitants. And when it speaks of the inhabitants, since it's fallen, it then speaks of that next level with all of its frailties, with all of its inabilities, with all of, all, all of its distinctives that are not God honoring. Inside of all of that, you have the control and you have the access through me with authority and power. He says, you shall bind on earth. And he says, and it shall be bound in heaven. What that is saying, it's not talking about there's a, a rope being tied in heaven. There's a rope being tied. This is why we know it's not talking about buildings. God is simply saying, when, when you have what you do and you do what you do within your heart, within ministry, within service, there on earth, I want you to know that I'm in agreement. I'm in harmony. I'm walking in step. We are walking as one in this. And what you're doing there, I'm making sure that it comes to fruition. That's huge. So when I pray about my son, when I pray about my wife, when I pray about my future, when I pray about God says, I hear those things because whatever you need to bind there on earth, I want you to know it's bound up here in heaven. Whatever you need to loose here on earth, I'm loosening it in heaven. So if I bind Satan, he's going to be bound down here. But if I loose your Holy Spirit, if I loose your Holy Ghost, and that Holy Ghost, that Holy Spirit is going to come in. It's going to do what it needs to do and guide us in our lives. And it's something to get excited about. God has given us so much authority, given us so much power. God says, listen, I'm giving you guarantees. This is facts. Right? This is, have you ever gone to purchase something and they said either insufficient funds or it was declined? Do you know God never swipes and it comes out insufficient? Well, here's what's even better. Do you know... 10 billion people prior to us, they swiped the same card, it worked. Do you know all of us can swipe today, it'll work. Do you know the 173,451 that are coming, they will swipe and that card will still, y'all just not getting it, it's not landing on y'all, I get it, I get it, but I get it, I get it, I'll fly by myself, I'll fly by myself. He says, listen, it shall be bound, and then he says, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed as well in heaven. It's all about us doing that. Where will it be loosed? It's clear. In his rule, in his realm, in his reign, in his royalty. Where else will it be? At his house, which means within his personhood, within his spirit. Oh, by the way, where did that spirit also reside? Within me. And so I have the keys within me. I have the keys outside of me. And I have the one who controls all the keys. Where do I have that? Right here on earth where I hang out. Even though it's fallen, God has given me all power in heaven and in earth to overcome. You have the keys. So walk in your authority. Father, Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your power. Thank you for meeting us in this place. We've taken in so much information. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would allow us to sift through, lift out the high points, the workable points, the parts that we can actually apply and use and do those with immediacy, that you may get the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you.